Hello, and welcome to the Reykjavik News Desk. I'm Andy Sophia Fontaine, and today I have a very special episode of the News Desk for you. If you like the content that you see on this channel, be sure and like and subscribe. And if you really like the content that you see here, check out the Patreon link in the description below, where you can see what kind of goodies you can get just by kicking a little extra coin our way. Amongst those goodies is being able to participate in my monthly Ask Me Anything session. And my very first one is going to be tomorrow at noon Eastern Standard Time. So there's still time for you to be able to sign up and participate. We would love to see you there. In this episode, I interview Aldestein Sikergeson, the Deputy Director of the Icelandic Forest Service. This interview was conducted over Zoom because he's currently in the West Fjords right now. And who can blame him? It's a beautiful part of the country. One of the oldest jokes that you'll ever hear about Iceland is the riddle, what do you do if you ever get lost in an Icelandic forest? The answer is stand up. And this is supposedly make, making fun of the lack of tree cover in this country. Well, the sagas tell us that about a quarter of the country used to be covered with forest. Today, it's about 2%. So in the interview, Alastain is going to talk about why reforesting Iceland is so important. For climate change reasons, employment reasons, of course, and agricultural reasons. But also because there you've started a little initiative wherein they're hoping to get refugees to take part in the reforesting of Iceland. I've linked to the English language page of the Icelandic Forestry Service in the description below, where you can read some of the history about forestry in Iceland. But I've also included a link to the Icelandic Forestry Association, which is a separate group. They're an NGO. And if you want to donate money to them to help plant trees around Iceland, there's a link in the description below that you can check out. It's going to be much easier with an Icelandic bank account, but I'm sure if you shoot them an email, which I've also included in the description, and say, hey, I want to send you money from abroad, how do I do that? I'm sure they'll be happy to help you out. But anyway, here's Alastain explaining the importance of reforesting Iceland, as well as the details of this exciting new project of his. Yes, my full name is Avalstedt Sigurgeirsson. Uh, and my title, well, I have many titles, actually, but <laughs> my main job is uh, I'm deputy the director of the Iceland Forest Service. And I'm also on several boards, forestry boards, including the uh, Forestry Association, which is an NGO. So first of all, um, uh, how much like forests are not usually the first thing that pops to mind when people think of the Icelandic landscape, about how much of Iceland is forested? Well, we have... Uh, if you'd been here 11 centuries ago, you found something like 25 to 40 percent of the country covered with birch forest, wow. native birch forest. Uh, that dwindled down below 1 percent at the turn of the century 1900. And if we say today we have about 1.5 percent native birch woodlands and another half percentage of cultivated forest planted tree planted in 0.5 percent going from 25 percent to about two percent total that's it's quite a change what happened to all the trees do we know humans yeah, yeah, humans, yeah. <laughs> well the country was settled first of all before mm -hmm. that there were no people here and what the, the settlers did was the same thing that humans do everywhere all around the world, they clear land for agriculture, for growing crops, or for sh their sheep and cattle, and and pigs in the beginning, mm -hmm. and uh, slowly that forest dwindled. Well, actually, most of the deforestation happened in the first century after settlement. Then they really cleared the land, and uh, after that, m we have that still ongoing environmental problem with soil erosion all around mm -hmm. the country. On a dry day, after a few days of dry weather, you'll have dust everywhere in the air from erosion, wind erosion. So that that's another uh, that's another consequence of deforestation or consequence of deforestation. I see. I see. And is the um, national government or the 
or the counties, is this, a, is this an important matter to them, foresting Iceland? Well, it hasn't really been very high on the agenda. You know, like in all of the countries, what's important to politicians and the government are whatever activities are already going on, you know, mm. fisheries and agriculture and so on, not growing forests because there hasn't been a forest industry. It's different yeah. from other countries. So regard. stuff that makes money is the stuff priority. That makes money is important. Yes. But what has changed quite a bit the attitude in recent years is, of course, uh, climate issues, mm. carbon sequestration with forests, with afforestation is a very important goal. And mm. uh, that's something that, you know, all politicians seem to agree on. Absolutely. That should be included. It's not very much talked about though in the general media because we're, of course, there are other means of reducing the carbon footprint of the Icelandic economy, you know, switch to electricity, stop burning fuel, fossil fuels. And by the way, Iceland has probably the one of the highest per capita emissions in the world, at least highest in Europe. Some yep. say higher than the US per capita. I don't know. It's very high. And uh, we need to reduce, of course, the direct emissions. But there are, is a limit to how far you can go in that regard. You also have to sequester some of the carbon, some of that CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, you know, just reducing emissions, even down to zero, isn't enough to avert climate change because there is so much CO2 in the atmosphere already. You have to exactly. suck it back somewhere. And that's and where the trees come in. That's where the, where the trees come in. And that's where we are in a rather unique position because we have a lot of land. We have only three people per square kilometer in this country. And most of that population is kind of centered in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of available land, a lot of land that could support tree growth, could support forests. And mm -hmm. of course, you don't just grow car forests for carbon reasons. I mean, there are yeah. other, there's, there are all the other benefits from having trees and shelter and reducing Certainly. erosion. And, Certainly. you know, even produ providing jobs in the long run. I mm -hmm. mean, we, we can expect quite a large immigration to this country in the next few years, and they're not all going to be living off tourism. You know, There are other exactly. things. So speaking of that, why don't you tell me about this project that you, that you have going on? Yes, this is a interesting. Uh, we our fastest growing tree species we have in this country is not the native birch. It is the black cottonwood from the coast of Alaska that's been growing. Well, it's been it was first planted just to, towards the end of the Second World War, mm -hmm. but it has shown to be the the fastest growing species and, and the species most interesting when it comes to carbon sequestration. Okay. And it's also, uh, it's a very easy species when it comes to uh, how to uh, produce seedlings. Well, it's really enough to stick a twig in the ground and it will root and form a tree. You that do, easily. You know, is this a, this is a case for all yeah. trees or just this particular tree? This particular, this okay. poplar black cottonwood. Okay. Because it can form new roots from from cuttings. And what we are doing now in the project, we had a we had a test project last year. We we put the aim of producing 250,000 uh, unrooted cuttings for direct planting into some sites. That worked very well and we are aiming to increase this in the coming years. And this year we aim at at least half a million, just mm -hmm. cuttings to be put directly into the ground, but also seedlings produced in the nursery. And mm -hmm. we, this is a kind of a, a project that has to go on from February until maybe early May. 
You cannot go further into the growing season. You have to do it while the twigs are dormant. And uh, we're calling on all kinds of people that might be interested to have an odd job, you know, on the side, work mm -hmm. on weekends, work in the evenings, do it from home for that matter. It's become a bit of a cottage industry. And I have a few uh, uh, few people working just at home because they have a garden shed or whatever. And uh, now we are looking into other possibilities as well. There is a workplace in Akranas that provides jobs to uh, disadvantaged groups, uh, people with handicaps and whatnot. They've already started that work. We're also looking into the possibilities of recruiting uh, uh, recruiting the, uh, the uh, refugees, especially we're looking into the Ukrainian refugees because they have already have work permits. It's not a problem, but also the other refugees that are kind of waiting and haven't very much to do, uh, to, both to give them a purposeful bit of work, but also make money on the side. They so, say. Yeah, that's my understanding is that the Ukrainian refugees, because they are expressly invited by the Icelandic government to come here, they do have the right to work, whereas asylum seekers exactly. uh, do not have the right to work until they exactly. get their in, their cases approved, if that happens. Yep. I've been in contact with the uh, Icelandic Red Cross on that issue, and you know, especially the asylum seekers, that could be a bit of a problem, but we're looking into hmm. that how to go about it, you know, keep it within legal means, but at least give them the possibility to to uh, contribute a bit and, and and do some work also on the side. Each, on I mean, the side in, my ex in my experience, like every single one of these folks who are waiting on their cases, they, they want to do yeah. something exactly with their time. And so that's that sounds fantastic. So for those who don't live in Iceland, but really like this initiative, what is the best way for them to be able to, to contribute in some way, to like make a donation or what have you? I belong to a government agency or institute, so we don't actually have a foundation of this kind, but mm -hmm. we have a very strong Icelandic pro-forest NGO, the uh, Forestry Association, and mm -hmm. which, which has... Uh, departments or special societies in 60 different places all around the country. And these are just people that are tree enthusiasts. They want to plant trees, but they are often hampered by the fact that, you know, they don't get very much local support. They have problems buying seedlings and so on. So mm -hmm. a contribution to them would be something that could be done. And they're also, those Forestry societies are actively trying also to recruit the, the, the local uh, immigrant groups that are often quite, you know, a large share of, of many of these municipalities. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are municipalities in Iceland that where the majority is foreign born now. Yes. And that's increasing. You know, just to, it, it is a means also of of increasing social capital and cohesion in societies to, to work together on some projects like this, where, you know, planting a recreation forest, tending forest, doing it to, together and so on, and getting to know and meet people. When you mentioned that people like work from home to be able to contribute to this, what are they doing at home to contribute to this? We, uh, we deliver to them, uh, a lorry full of branches, and then they cut it into specified lengths according to the prescriptions, you know, must be this thick and this long and so on. And then uh, I, we drop by and, and pick it up and they send the, the bill to the Forest Service for their, for the, for their uh, cuttings that are, they produced. That's amazing. So it's, it can be done from home. You don't need to go to a workplace. But of course, it's also nice to meet other people. So there you have it. Sounds like pretty exciting stuff, doesn't it? Again, all the relevant links are in the description below. I want to thank Alistair for taking the time 
to talk to me about this exciting project of his. And again, if you like the content that you see here, be sure and like and subscribe. If you really check like the content that you see here, check out the Patreon in the description below, which reminds me, I want to thank Corinne Vasquez and Marion Ward for donating on the $20 level. I want to thank Marion Moores and Laura Johnson for donating on the $15 level. And I want to thank Stephen Ellis and Vivi Carvalho Schaffner, Vivi Carvalho Schaffner, <laughs> rather, for donating on the $10 level. And as I said, my first EM AMA, my first Ask Me Anything session, is going to be tomorrow at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. And so you still have time to sign up now if you want to take part in that. And what can I say? I look forward to doing more interviews like this with some really cool people in the future. So until then, thanks for watching. Be good to each other.